Thank you so much for taking your time for attending this session, where we'll be talking about how we automated the medical coverage analysis using Cloud Vision API and Google Cloud Machine Learning Engine. I'm Dhruva Reddy Thiruvaru. I'm a Cloud Data Engineer at Pluto7. We are a Google Cloud Premier Partner. And alongside with me on the stage, I have Allison and Joanne. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Allison Oroqua. I'm in Research Administration at the University of Southern California. I am Joanne Pack, and I'm also at USC. I do coverage analysis. Very good. Uh, without further ado, let me pull up today's session outline. Uh, after a brief introduction of Pluto7 and USC, uh, we'll cover the, Allison will be covering the goals of research enterprise, followed by Joanne. She'll be covering medical coverage analysis workflow, and then we'll tackle the meat of the matter behind how we automated the medical coverage analysis uh, at uh, USC. And then we'll open up for uh, Q&A. If you have any specific questions, feel free to drop by after the talk and get it clarified. So Pluto7, we are a key partner for implementation of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning at Google Cloud. Uh, we bring AI and ML implementation to the customers who either do not have the staff, know-how, the department, or if they need any extended hands, we dive in as a team. We understand their use case, what they're trying to achieve, and look at their data to see if it's achievable. And then we work in tandem with the customers throughout the journey of uh, their machine learning, uh, right from the project kickoff to the production. And similarly, we went to USC where we uh, demonstrated a so uh, by providing a solution to the USC, showing them how we can leverage machine learning and AI to automate uh, medical coverage analysis. Over to you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruva, and thanks to Google Cloud for inviting us. So as you probably know, the University of Southern California is a large private university and academic medical center located in Los Angeles, California. We have strong research programs in many clinical areas such as cancer, biomedical imaging, neurosciences, stem cells, and many more. And collectively, our researchers conduct at least 20, sorry, 200 clinical trials per year. And those clinical trials, the goal of them are to basically better understand diseases as well as um, create new therapies and new standards of care for patients. So our Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, where I'm from, is charged with improving, enhancing the research pipeline to get more treatments to more patients more quickly. And given our local population in LA, we bring special expertise in diverse populations, engaging diverse people in clinical research, and we bring that expertise to our larger national network of institutes like ours. And that's important because when you test a treatment just with one segment of the population, you don't know how well that treatment will work for everybody else. So we aim to correct that by bringing in more Los Angelinos into clinical research and also trying to enhance the research efficiency for all studies. So two years ago, um, we surveyed researchers at USC and many people complained about different admi administrative processes, burdens, like too much paperwork, too many systems, long approval times, and unclear requirements. And it's true, in the, we, met, we were able to measure it and in the long life cycle of a single clini clinical trial, from coming up with the idea to publishing the results, there is a long pause in the middle. And it's not actual science that's going on during this pause. The pause is for approvals and logistics. There are important things, of course, like ethics committees to make sure that the patients are you know, undergoing something that's safe. Um, they're setting up pharmacy orders and they're negotiating contracts and budgets with the pharmaceutical companies or other sponsors who are paying for the study. 
And so this activation process within the, the red circles, that takes about 10 to 20 people at least 80 hours per study um, to complete with lots of back and forth and long response times. So even though it's 80 man hours, it can take up to three months on average. And so that translates into a delay in getting the treatments to patients. So we decided it's time to change. We embarked on a process improvement initiative to make the entire activation process faster and more streamlined and more transparent for the research teams at USC. Our scope was studies that use hospital resources where the study-related costs had to be distinguished and separated from the regular clinical care costs. And we decided to take a lean process improvement approach. And to do that, we worked with a partner in the USC Marshall School of Business who runs the Global Center for Supply Chain Management. And our thinking there was that if his center could improve quality and speed in manufacturing, it could probably work for research. Um, so we formed these working groups and we got to work. And this was quite a culture shift because as you may know, speed is not exactly the number one priority in academic administration. Um, but the exercise of looking step by step in everybody's individual processes compared to all the other offices involved in the whole activation process, that exercise of mapping the workflow really helped us see the duplication that exists and the redundancies. It helped us identify these bottlenecks and the friction points, which we termed opportunities for improvement. Um, and then we took a step back and we tried to together create an ideal future state workflow and started to implement those improvements. And this is too small to read, of course, but this diagram should just give you an, a, a sense of how complex the research activation process is. And that's the future state diagram. Um, so fast forward a couple years. By last year, we had implemented almost uh, over a quarter of the steps, which is a big reduction in waste and duplication. And it was just small incremental improvements by reducing a um, you know, cutting out a step here and there and introducing new, new processes. And we have made the majority of the changes in real life. And the outcome has been faster approvals for studies. So the average has dropped from about 80 to around 60 days. And we think another outcome is a happier researcher community. So we uh, surveyed the research community again. And they said the process has become easier and less frustrating. But we know we have more to do. So in the spirit of continuous improvement, we wanted to keep the momentum going. And we knew we had an opportunity to really improve further with exponential technology. So we turned to Google Cloud and machine learning and AI. And with the help of Pluto 7, we uh, were able to see the potential of using those technologies in one piece of the process. So using a proof of concept project with Pluto 7, we applied ML and AI to the part of the budgeting process that's called Medicare coverage analysis. And I'll now turn it over to our MCA expert at USC, Joanne Peck. So MCA is Medicare coverage analysis. And so basically, this is our workflow. This is not just for USC, but this is usually what happens in other academic sites. So, so Medicare coverage analysis, basically what we do is we look at the studies and look at the, the um, services that we have to do, tests and procedures, and determine it will be covered by Medicare. So as it says, Medicare coverage analysis, like, is this going to be covered by Medicare? So in 2000, in the 2000 Clinton administration um, instituted a clinical trial policy. Basically what it is is that if there are, if it is a qualifying clinical trial, certain items and services can be billed to the insurance, even though it's doing inside of the clinical trial. 
So um, with that and all the research that we do, we perform Medicare coverage analysis. And this is a just small part of the uh, whole research process that Allison was talking about. And this is where Pluto 7 and USC partner to go over. And perhaps that we can bring machine learning and AI to streamline and reduce the time they were spending. So the process is that protocol, we receive a protocol document, meaning that's the study document where it has study design and objectives and what we need to do, what we are trying to accomplish through this clinical trial and who's going to do what and what needs to be done. So it's a PDF, usually PDF document. We receive it and as a coverage analyst like myself, we'll review the protocol. And protocol is usually pretty thick and there are a lot of scientific language, but what main thing that we look at is what's called study calendar, something that looks like this. This is just off from a protocol. Uh, study calendar, schedule event, we call it. It shows on the left side what things needs to be done at what time point. So this is just the, from a, um, a protocol that's out there. And so we review the study calendar, and which is in, um, PDF form, and in order for us to do coverage analysis, at USC, we use something called Encore. It's a CTMS, Clinical Trial Management System. It's a software. We, we do everything in Encore. However, in many institutions, they, if they are not using Encore or CTMS, what they choose to do it in Excel spreadsheet. So basically, if we didn't have Encore, what as a person, what I had to do is get the uh, read the uh, protocol and look at this. Uh, page and then create basically copy and paste manually. So I'm typing everything on the left side and then creating all the columns and putting all the X's. X's just mean it's happening at this point. Um, so that's the first step, basically creating an Excel version for all the studies to be done. At this point, I'm not doing any analysis, I'm just copying it. And this is where Pluto 7 came in and they were able to extract this information into Excel spreadsheet by machine learning in AI. And Druva is gonna explain into details of a technicality of that. So once that's done, and on, um, what we do first is we have to find out if it's a qualifying clinical trial. QCT stands for qualifying clinical trial. So qualifying clinical trial, there's a set of questions that we have to answer. Um, there are a few questions answered, but what's most important is the three questions, they all have to be answered yes. The first one is, does this, um, we call it IP. IP stands in clinical trials means the investigational product. So for if the drug is an investigational product, brand new drug, let's say a company is developing, is that um, fall into Medicare benefit category? Medicare benefit category is just the list of services that can be covered by Medicare. Not clinical trial, just by Medicare. Like for my mother who is on Medicare, when she goes to annual checkup, that's covered. And when she needs an eye exam, that's not covered. So it's like Medicare benefit category. So first we say, does this have in the medical, medic, Medicare benefit category? And if it is a drug, it's usually drugs and biologicals. So I say yes. And the next question is, does this study have a therapeutic intent? Meaning, is this study going to somehow bring um, quality of life or extend your, um, the, created some type of treatment, and not just the collecting data, not just to see if does it have a toxicity. So does it, does it have a therapeutic intent? Yes. So, and then next question is, does this accrue disease, uh, diagnosed disease? So meaning, does study have the, toward the like breast cancer patients? or uh, pulmonary disease. But so if it is yes, those all three questions have to be answered yes. And once it's answered yes, that there's a fourth question that has to be answered um, that's deemed trial. So these are usually, if it is a study, is funded by government, National uh, Institute of Health, or Department of, uh, 
uh, Department of Defense or any government agency funding it, it's automatically deemed. Or does it have IND, investigation or new drug um, application filed to FDA? So these are the type of questions we go through in QCT checklist. And then once it says it's a qualifying trial, it's a yes or no. And the qualifying trial just means that if there are items and services being done in the trial, even though it's doing only for the study, it can be billed to the Medicare. If it is not qualifying, those investigational items cannot be built to insurance. So for an example, if I'm a healthy, if I'm a clinical trial, I'm a healthy subject, and I'm on this clinical trial for, and if I'm not on a clinical trial, I'll just go to see my doctor once a, once a year. That can be built to Medicare. But if I'm a clinical trial and they want to see me every month, they want to blood, draw blood, that's something that's not going to be covered by Medicare on a non-qualified clinical trial. So that's what we do. And then that's the, that question drives next part. And then what the next part means is that when we see this one, we have to determine, for an example, very top informed consent. That's something I look at it, go, is this going to, is this considered a research item or what we call standard of care? Informed consent just simply means that patient is signing a consent form that is, I want to be in this clinical trial. So if the patient is not on a clinical trial, there's no reason for them to sign informed consent. So there'll be research. But um, usually then if you go down, let's say there's a, there's a complete physical exam. Physical exam is being done at screening and then one below is abbreviated physical exam that's being done at, at different time points. So at these different time points, research meaning something other than insurance is going to pay for it. As standard care meaning, it can be built to the Medicare and insurance. So like extracting it, for in this example, we say screening for the physical exam at screening very first visit, we say it's a research. But then you go down and then determine that each one of them are whether standard care research. So that's the process of Medicare coverage analysis. And that analyzing each one of them, uh, it's not just me just saying, oh, okay, I feel like saying in research, I feel like saying in standard care. But we do go by the national coverage this determination. There's a government um, reference that we have to follow, or there's a national um, society guidelines. For cancer trials, we have something called NCCN guidelines, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, that tells us, okay, for these patients in a breast cancer study to have the image um, CT scans done every six months is something routine. So we use that reference point to make that determination. So this whole process takes from like basically somebody sitting down, reading the protocol, extracting it, reading or finding all the references, and then making into this determination. This is a very lengthy process because it's not something that if I don't do it right, then USC can be um, fine because it's you know something that I, even though I may, may be a mistake, but if I did not do the determination correctly, if I build something to the Medicare incorrectly, that's the, the Medicare would, would should be the last payer, and then I'm saying that you are the first payer. So this is our manual process that we go through, and then Druva is going to come and how the Pluto 7 came in and streamlined what part of this um, process in the swim lane. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Joanne and Allison. Um, so this is how it works. Uh, we have clinical trials protocols coming in the form of a PDF. Uh, they are stored in Google Cloud Storage. Google Cloud Storage is a uh, RESTful online file system web service offered by Google where you can store and access your data on GCP infrastructure. And followed by that, we have uh, App Engine here. App Engine is a serverless instance. It's fully managed. By fully managed, I mean that the applications that are deployed on the App Engine scales automatically. And you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. 
all you have to focus on is your code. Over here, App Engine acts as a, a choreographer, like a data manager. Uh, it forwards the data into the Cloud Vision API. Cloud Vision API is a pre-built machine learning model offered by Google, which can be accessed through uh, RESTful API. It helps us to enable and detect the text present in the clinical trial protocols and extract it. And followed by that, we have a cloud machine learning engine uh, where we hosted our uh, uh, 1D convolutional neural network model. Uh, it's a serverless and fully managed, uh, or you can also custom uh, select your uh, resources that you'd like. And it also offers uh, uh, training and predicting services individually or together. Uh, I have kept the talk high level. Uh, but if you have any specific questions regarding uh, the technical details, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, before going to the next slide, by show of hands, how many of you here are data scientists and data engineers? Very good. It's a pretty good number. And I'll, let me talk about the data set. The data set that we use here are from two different sources. Uh, one is uh, USC registry that the historical uh, clinical trial protocols they had over the years. And followed by that, we had uh, uh, publicly available data sets uh, that we got from uh, clinicaltrial.gov. Uh, it's United States Library of uh, Medicine. They are offering this. And it had uh, clinical trial statements extracted from uh, 40,000 plus clinical trial protocols. I feel that this data set is uh, really good as it was written in the clinical trial terms. And it's publicly available in the uh, URL mentioned here. So on your left, you can see a, a snapshot of one of the pages of the uh, clinical trial protocol, which has the uh, study objectives, primary objectives, secondary objectives, and so on. Uh, we are passing the clinical trial protocols in the form of a PDF uh, into Cloud Vision API, which is a pre-built machine learning model that I mentioned before. Uh, it has multiple features, like label detection, logo detection, face recognition, handwriting recognition. But in this project, we leverage optical character recognition feature of uh, uh, Cloud Vision API, where it could uh, uh, de uh, detect and extract the text out of the PDFs. And followed by that, text pre-processing is an integral part, an extremely important step of uh, machine learning journey. Uh, we spent significant amount of time there because we, it, it, the quality of data and the amount of uh, uh, information that you can extract out of the data is extremely important, and it determines the ability of your uh, quality of the model. And we spent significant amount of time there uh, in pre-processing. As part of pre-processing, uh, we, uh, we transformed all the statements that were extracted by Cloud Vision API into a sequence of words separated by a white space. And then we also had to remove the punctuations, uh, special characteristics, uh, uh, characters like uh, non-alphanumeric symbols, like question marks, um, or all the Greek signs, et cetera. And then once we pre-process the data, we found that the data was highly unbalanced. The data are called unbalanced when, uh, when, when a class of data has a huge dominance over the other. Over here, 70% of the uh, uh, statements that were extracted were labeled as research, like Joanne was mentioning. Research is something that Medicare doesn't cover, whereas standard is. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, standard statements to only 30% of the entire uh, uh, statements that were extracted. And to overcome that, we used a, uh, a random unbalanced uh, uh, undersampling. What does that mean is uh, we uh, take the uh, classes from the uh, minority classes and match it against the majority so that uh, uh, they are equal and 
use the rest of the classes during validation. Followed by that, we did embedded training. We used an approach, I mean, used an open source library called FastText. It's used for text representation and then uh, 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 text classification and Vertebec uh, representation. Uh, FastText is an extension of Vertebec. It's a predictive model that uses a raw text as input, and it predicts the word given its uh, uh, surrounding and the context and vice versa. Over here, once we uh, did the embedded training, we tested it out uh, using a very rare word, which is gastroenteritis. Uh, thanks to Joanne, this is how we will work with the customers to understand their data, and that's where their domain expertise comes in. Uh, it's a very rare data, and as you can see, it could figure out the uh, uh, corresponding embeddings for, for that particular word. Oh, here it didn't even appear in the training data, but the fast, te uh, fast text uh, embedded training could figure out the word embeddings, uh, whereas when we tried out other open source libraries, it threw an error since, since the, that gastroenteritis word wasn't present in the training uh, cops. By the way, if, if anyone is wondering what that gastroenteritis is, it's a type of a flu. <laughs> I mean, Joanne helped, uh, helped me to understand what that is. So it could, uh, uh, faster text word embedding could also figure out, you know, it could generate better word embeddings for rare words, and also it could find word embeddings for the words which are not even in the part of, you know, the vocabulary. And as a part of next step, uh, we, a text classifier was trained using a deep, deep neural networks with a pre-trained embeddings that we built in the previous steps as inputs to predict whether or not the short free st uh, text statements that are extracted uh, using the Cloud Vision API um, uh, is, a, is a standard, or that means whether it's covered by a Medicare or it's covered by research. So the pre-trained word embeddings were used as input for uh, uh, 1D convolutional neural networks, uh, and we hosted that on, to, on a Google Cloud machine learning engine. So those three points are uh, uh, the steps that we have taken before uh, uh, deploying our GCM, uh, model onto GCMLE, which is converting all the sentences into data set in the sequence of word indexes. And uh, we shuffle the training and test data sets and also prepare an embedding matrix which contain an index i, the embedding vector for the word uh, from the index i. And this is the overall model, um, where, where the input text, which is pre-processed and labeled, is, uh, you know, is taken. And we did an embedded training, uh, uh, fast text, which is an extension of Vertovec. And then uh, we, we trained text classifier using 1D uh, convolutional neural network. And we got the predictions, which are whether, whether the particular statement is a research or standard. So these are all the results. Our model could uh, uh, predict whether that statement is uh, research or standard with 86% of accuracy. And the other advantages of uh, the model that we have built is it's quick to train on GPU. So uh, within 10 to 15 minutes, we were able to uh, train our model. And then we could, you know, we could try out multiple architectures within a short amount of time. And the other one is use CPU at inference time. Uh, once your model is up and running, you, know, you don't need a GPU. You can do it on CPU, which is lower cost compared to GPU. And the third point is you can train periodically if required. Consider if um, a new set of protocols comes into their registry and the gui guidelines keep changing, so new drugs come in. So you can keep your model updated by uh, retraining it periodically if necessary. And right, so I'll pass it on to Alison. Just in terms of closing, from USC's perspective, we really felt like this was a successful proof of concept project. So the concept has been proven um, compared to a human only uh, determination process. 
this technology really showed that it could drastically reduce the time needed um, for this part of the processing. So we hope that we can extend the solution beyond breast cancer and to other pieces of the whole puzzle and really make an impact in the speed of research activation and other areas of the research life cycle. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.